This is the anatomical orientation. Um, again, you've seen this several times, but repetition is really key here. The choroid plexus will lead you into the foramen if for some reason you're um, not seeing the foramen when you come in and your orientation is off, follow the choroid plexus, it will lead you right to the third ventricle. And typically the septal vein and the thalamostriate veins will converge right where the choroid plexus dives down and folds underneath into the roof of the third ventricle. Here you can see the anatomy really nicely because this is a large ventricle. The fornix um, is labeled F, the septum pellucidum is on the left, um, and then you're looking through the, the foramen of Monroe at the third ventricle where you can actually make out most of the anatomy even from here, from this view, you can see the mammillary body on the left very clearly. You can see the infundibular recess anteriorly. Um, the floor of the third here appears a little bit opaque. Here's a little bit of a zoomed in view. So this is not the clearest floor of the third ventricle. The dorsum cellae is gonna be white and bright and the basal artery is gonna be red. But you can see that sometimes it's not completely clear. The walls of the third ventricle, the hypothalamic uh, walls here are coming up at you vertically and you can see the mammillary bodies down at the bottom here. So everyone looks slightly different. These features will typically be the consistent uh, anatomic features that will guide you um, at this point in the surgery. Lots of different techniques here. Um, I'm a firm believer in blunt perforation. Um, the, I've seen tons of videos and there are some experts throughout the world that believe in thermocoagulation still. I see videos to this day where people are putting um, little, bo little bovie tips through the floor of the third ventricle. I've never found it necessary. And frankly, you know, it scares me a little bit, the idea of a perforator getting injured um, from heat. So whether you want to use it for a blunt perforation or for heat is important, but uh, blood perforation, nothing sharp, no scissors, um, no knives, nothing like that through the floor of the third ventricle. It's got to be a very, very blunt perforation. You'll see on every video, it's kind of like a little push and then a plop through. So gentle trend tension and then the floor will break through. Um, I, I use a three French embolectomy catheter. That seems to be the size that um, uh, works best. It fits through the um, scope really nicely and it dilates up to a beautiful dimension. And then you're going to see lots of mention of the membrane of Lilliquist. The importance of that in creating a, a, a patent ETV and then the exploration of the prepontine subarachnoid space. So we'll go through each of these. So here's the blunt perforation. <clears throat> here's a three French embolectomy catheter blown up. So it looks enormous through the endoscope, right? Three French is really quite tiny. And if you're doing one of these cases this year on a rotation, take it off the field before it's used, blow it up and take a look at how small it is. And that'll give you the size, the exact dimensions of what the stoma is in relation. Because sometimes under the endoscope, it's a little hard to tell. There's the membrane of Lilliquist through the floor of the third ventricle. So even if the floor of the third is completely perforated, if that membrane um, is partially or fully occluded, that ETV is not gonna function as well and it's likely that it's gonna occlude at some point um, and become um, a, um, a non-functioning ETV stoma. In the prepontine subarachnoid space, it's always nice to get a look down here, even if it's just a quick peek, the basilar artery is coming vertically at you, so sometimes you can barely see it. You can see the front of the brain stem there, P is for pons. Um, and then all those white fibers, those are actually the membranes of Lilliquist that are going from the brain stem across the clivus. And so these are stringy fibers are fine when it's an occlusive membrane, that's when the CSF flow is not gonna be adequate. So beautiful views here. Um, there's a rule against sort of voyeurism in you know, endoscopic surgery, not too much looking around, but you do wanna take a quick look through the soma and make sure that those membranes are, are fenestrated appropriately. So I'm gonna spend the next, I think 15 or 20 minutes, we're gonna go through a bunch of videos here. This is a tumor biopsy ETV case. You can see the, the tumor at the bottom left at around seven o'clock. We're gonna focus now orienting ourselves vertically. This is actually an interesting case because you can see stippling along the floor of the third ventricle there, which is actually a disseminated disease. The, um, the sort of cherry red spot in the front here, right? That's where the, um, the infundibulum is. And um, here are the mammillary bodies. So even though there's anatomic distortion here, um, you can tell that you're off by um, a good you know, 60 or 70 degrees here and you need to rotate your scope. So getting the orientation correct um, is the first thing that you do and finding those anatomic landmarks is gonna be key to having successful surgery. So here's a more you know, appropriate vertical orientation, nice anatomy, there's the fornix. I'm gonna angle the scope down and come down into the third ventricle. There's your mammillary bodies, right? So, you can identify those every time. You're gonna get yourself on midline. 
here the floor of the third ventricle is a, a bit clearer, so you can actually see um, the vascular complex. You can, you can see what's probably the basilar artery and the PCA is going out laterally. The clivus, which is right where the um, device is angled right now, and the infidibulum at 12 o'clock. Pushing right up against the interval, right along the clivus there, gives you a safety margin. What I like to do typically is, is sort of find the dorsum cellae and just sort of ride down it, particularly in, in cases where there's a very, very narrow interval between the bone and the basilar artery. As long as you start on the clivus, these are techniques that you'll see, and you'll see lots of variations on a theme here. You can almost slide off of the dorsum cellae and into that prepontine um, space there by pushing down on the, on, the, on the floor of the third ventricle, and you don't have to worry about you know, the risk of vascular injury. <clears throat> here the dilation of uh, the balloon, Lots of um, different techniques here. Uh, how aggressive you might be with dilation of the stoma um, is something that I've seen lots of variation on as well. Um, there are some cases where the floor is so patchless and redundant that you need to coagulate back the edges a little bit. Again, I'm a little bit hesitant to do that too vigorously, although I've seen it done with great success and I think it can be a really useful technique. And there, the floor of the third ventricle is pulsating so nicely. You know that that stoma is going to be patent for a long time. There's no way that that's going to close off. Again, we inspect the fornix on the way out and ensure that there's been no damage from the endoscope. And so the whole procedure, you know, that, that baby may be in the operating room for two hours, but the actual endoscopic procedure is about a two-minute surgery. So incredibly rewarding, great anatomy, and that's, a, that's sort of an optimal technique illustrated there. <clears throat> Here's another case coming in. So cord plexus, a little bit more distorted anatomy here, but an incredibly thin floor. So here you can see the vascular complex absolutely beautifully. You can see the infundibular recess. You can see the optic chiasm up above. So this is a case where you have a beautiful interview, in, interval between the dorsum and, and the arterial system. So no concern right there about anything vascular um, occurring. You can be very bold. You can be aggressive here. You can dilate up as much as you want with the stoma. Um, the balloon is not going to create any vascular injury at this point. It's going to push those large vessels away. Um, uh, I don't have any personal experience with this, thankfully, but I think most reports of vascular injury really are during the perforation um, due to lack of visualization. Um, and I'll, I'm going to mention this at the end. There's absolutely no um, problem with aborting an ETV if you don't feel like it's safe to do it. Hopefully, you know, that won't occur too often in your career. But it has been it's something that I've done, and I've um, felt completely uncomfortable without being able to recognize any of the anatomy, I, even after doing hundreds of these, and um, decided that it wasn't safe, and we withdrew and, and proceeded to a shunt. And absolutely no problem with doing that and keeping the patient safe, which is always the ultimate goal. So that was a really simple, straightforward interval. You can see the anatomy perfectly there, and again, coming through backwards, inspecting the fornix, and then inspecting the cortical surface as you come out would be typical. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you liked that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.